So today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about my thesis research, or part of my thesis research, on the population dynamics, dispersal, and behavior of the California red-legged frog. Ordinarily, I like to start out any talk with a brief description of amphibian decline and why it's important, but I think for this crowd, I can jump straight to my study species and system, and then get into my research topics, which include metapopulation dynamics, dispersal behavior, and interspecific interactions. So briefly, the red-legged frog is the largest frog native west of the Rockies, and it was listed as threatened under the Endangered Species Act in 1996. It's estimated to have been extirpated from 70% of its historical habitat. And major threats to the frog include habitat destruction and degradation, invasive predators, and potentially disease. I work down in Moss Landing, California, along the Elkhorn Slough, on two pieces of property, the privately owned Packard Ranch and the Elkhorn Slough Reserve, which is part of the National Estuarine Research Reserve System. There's 15 ponds on the Packard Ranch and four to nine, depending on rainfall, at the Elkhorn Slough. I chose these sites because I feel they're representative of the types of habitat available to the frogs along the central coast. So there's bullfrogs and disease at the Packard Ranch, as well as disease and deformity at Elkhorn Slough. And I'll be getting into the ongoing management at the sites later. My main research questions are, do red-legged frogs exhibit metapopulation dynamics? What's the upland habitat use of the red-legged frog? And what are the indirect effects of bullfrog presence on red-legged frogs? So I mentioned metapopulation dynamics. What do I mean? This term was first coined by Levins in 1969, and he envisioned a metapopulation as a population of populations linked by dispersal events and characterized by periodic extinction and colonization events. Oops. Uh, this basic model has since been modified to include source sink dynamics, island mainland models, core satellite models, and we're no longer as tied to patch extinction and colonization dynamics. Researchers have looked at factors such as patch quality, the effects of matrix habitat on dispersal, and interspecific interactions with a special focus on predator-prey dynamics. One thing that's been true of most of these models is that they've relied heavily on borrowed parameters and estimates, and so it's been difficult to apply them to real species. So I want you to briefly imagine a landscape um, with the simplest type of model where each patch is of equal size, and each patch is linked to every other pa patch with equal rates of dispersal. We can then start to vary this model by changing patch size and assuming that individuals only move to the nearest neighboring sites with equal rates of immigration and emigration. We can then start to vary rates of dispersal with some patches having a net outflow of individuals and others having a net inflow, which these sort of source sink dynamics might lead to patch extinction over time. So the thing I want you to get from this is that it's a continuum of possibility. The ponds I'm looking at may be, dis may be connected by really high rates of dispersal, in which case we would have to consider all of the ponds to be one population, or dis dispersal might be extremely rare, and we'd have to treat each pond individually and assume that there's no chance of recolonization. So to get, the, to get at these dynamics, I'm pit tagging all individuals at these sites, both on the Packard Ranch and Elkhorn Slough, to estimate survivorship between years, transition rates between um, ponds, and population size. I'm surveying for egg masses and trying to estimate relative larval, larval abundance as number of tadpoles per dip net per adult female at the ponds. And I'm assuming that there has to be a better way to do this, and so I'd love input on that. I'm then going to be fitting this data to a simple metapopulation model, and I'll be using my other research to inform making this model more realistic. Come on. <laughs> Next slide, please. <laughs> Next slide, please. <laughs> okay. okay. Well, I'll just drink water. Oh, Ooh. okay. Skip, 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 skip. Do, 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 do. Okay, so to get at what effect matrix habitat is having on the movement of the frogs, I've been radio tracking 25 adult frogs this year, and we'll be doing it again next year. There's been data collected before, and there's ongoing research on the upland habitat usage, but I feel like I also need site-specific information for my uh, two field sites. I'm as focusing on what type of vegetation they're using, whether or not they're 
using riparian corridors for movement, and I'm trying to figure out how important pond proximity is on determining where a frog will move. So far, I've found that my, the frogs I had tagged were burrowed in underground tunnels 10.5% of the time. I'm not sure what's making those tunnels, but I believe it to be ground squirrels. And I initially thought that they were using the tunnels solely as refugia, but as I dig up more and more frogs, I'm also digging up crickets and garden snails and other invertebrates, and so I, I'm starting to think they might actually be foraging underground. In general, they moved out of the ponds with the first rains, and I didn't see any long-distance movement thus far, which is different than other studies. They stayed within about 50 meters of the pond, but were out of the pond about 36% of the time. When they were in the pond, they were about three meters from shore and in water about half a meter deep, and they were predominantly using tule and pennywort for cover. So I want to draw your attention back to the management, and you'll notice that at the Packard site, there's an ongoing bullfrog eradication. And so this led me to ask, how does changing bullfrog presence affect the red-legged frog? And you can imagine that there would be both a numerical response and a behavioral response. So this is data for one pond that shows the increase in adult red-leggeds over time as bullfrogs are eradicated. And this is about 18 months of field work. And you'll notice that adult red-legged started showing up after the first bullfrogs were taken out. And it's important that these are adults because this is suggesting that those adults were already in the surrounding vegetation, but I just wasn't seeing them. This is just, again, some more data from all of the ponds on the property to show that there was a net increase in red-legged during, during the bullfrog eradication. So this led me to become interested in trait-mediated indirect interactions, which in plain speak is just the effects of a predator on their prey item. This, has been, this sort of thing's been shown before with northern red-legged frogs and bullfrog at the larval stage, that red-legged larvae spend less time feeding, more time hiding, and metamorphose at a smaller size when in the presence of bullfrog larvae. So I'm interested in what's going on with the adults and the juveniles. And thus far, I've observed changes in both the microhabitat usage and the, in their breeding behavior. So the juvenile red-leggeds are shifting the distance they are from shore in the presence of bullfrog adults. They're moving off of shore, and rather than just sitting half in and half out of the water, they're moving into the, the surrounding vegetation. At least that's what I think explains this pattern. The adult red-leggeds are utilizing shallower water in general um, in the presence of adult bullfrogs. And I think this is actually due to an averaging of the fact that they're moving completely out of the water or moving very deep into the water. Because I was collecting data on individual frog placement within the ponds, I've also noticed this trend that age classes are occupying different distances from shore, uh, with the adults being farthest away, the small adults being inter intermediate, and the juveniles being closest to shore. And not surprisingly, I see the same trend with water depth, as water depth and distance from shore is highly correlated. I've noticed some other interesting patterns, but because the bullfrog eradication has occurred quite quickly, and because there are these differences in, in how age classes respond to the eradication, this data, the rest of the data is sort of still inconclusive, but I'll be conducting further work that I'll talk about later. So then I've also observed that the bullfrogs seem to be changing red-legged breeding behavior. I observe the red-leggeds to give calls of varying complexity. They can either give their sort of signature short stuttering call, or they can tack on an optional growling sound at the end. Complex calls have been shown in other species to make them more susceptible to certain kinds of predation and also make them more attractive to females. The well-known example of this is the Tungara frog, which, in the presence of the frog-eating bat, decreases the rate of complex calling. I found one reference in the literature, and it was in a field guide, and I couldn't find it anywhere else, but it said that bullfrogs have been known to hone in on the breeding calls of other species to eat them. I don't know if it's true, but it certainly seems to be the pattern thus far. Bullfrog presence seems to be de decreasing the rate of complex calling but this was a pattern I noticed late in the breeding season last year, and I'd only been able to compare across five ponds. So this year, I'll be looking at at least 10 sites with red-leggeds and bullfrogs both present to note the complexity of the first 50 calls that I hear at the sites, as well as the microhabitat usage of each individual. I'll also be taking data on the density of each species to, and also looking at as many other sites as possible with red-leggeds breeding to see how their breeding behavior changes with their own density and the density of Pacific tree frogs. I'll also be looking at all pairs and amplexus to note the species composition because, as you'll see here, 
those aren't red-legged. <laughs> the one on top's a red-legged, the bottom one's a juvenile bullfrog. And so far, it's been the pattern. Um, even with most of the bullfrogs being gone from the Packard site, the red-leggeds are still breeding with bullfrogs, preferentially. <laughs> and I don't know if the, it's a size trigger that they find them more attractive, but I'll be keeping an eye on this pattern. <laughs> so in, in summary, I hope to learn more about how the red-legged frogs utilize the upland habitat so we know where to focus management efforts and how to time land use applications. I'm hoping to find other effects of bullfrogs on red-legged frogs besides the well-documented direct predation and competition for resources. I'm hoping to expand the biological realism of dispersal models as well as generate an understanding of at what scale we're dealing with the population and when we're dealing with something more. I'd like to give special thanks to my committee members, Kirsten Wasson, Pete Ramundi, Norm Scott, and Dan Doak, to the Elkhorn Slough and the Elkhorn Ranch for allowing me to work on their property, for endless hours of uh, help in the field, Mike, Mikey McNicholas and Eric Kirby, and I'd like to add that I don't pay them anything, so field assistants don't always have to be expensive. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the Myers Trust Fund, Sigma Xi, UCSC, Pisco, the Elkhorn Slough, and especially the Steps Institute. Thanks. <laughs>